Welcome. Welcome, my friends, to the show that never ends, the Audiophiliac Daily Show with your host, Steve Guttenberg. But today it is all about the Audio Research LS28SE. It's part of their foundation series. And by the way, Audio Research is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. That's pretty incredible. The, the preamp is fully balanced. It's handcrafted in Minnesota. It comes with a three-year warranty, blah, 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 blah. But first, I want to start with this. I, I have to confess that I am a lapsed Audio Research fanboy. My first preamp, my first two preamp, was an Audio Research SP6B in, I think, 1981 or so. And I love that preamp. And then uh, many decades later, to try to recapture that, I bought an SP6. C and I love that one and then I had a cousin who wanted it so it's complicated I had also had an SP14 I had a classic 30 power amp. I had a lot of audio researchers pass through this room I want to tell you well where I am in relationship to audio research now there have been times over this 50 year span where I felt that audio research was a little too too neutral too neutral too accurate for my taste I wanted a more to be rich, warm sound than Audio Research was supplying. And that's because the founder of Audio Research, William Z. Johnson, wasn't shooting for to be sound. He wanted accuracy. He wanted a high definition sound. So let's get into the nuts and bolts. So here's, here's the inside. Just feast your eyes on, on those capacitors. Just, it's just beautiful. It's a beautifully constructed piece of gear. Uh, let's look at the back panel. So you see there's four sets of balanced XLR inputs, four sets of RCA, RCA single-ended inputs, and three outputs. That's two main, and one is a record out if you're using a recorder of some sort, I suppose. <laughs> I don't think too many people do, but it's nice that it's there. So let's get to the price. The price is ten grand, ten thousand dollars and uh, I think it's worth it in the scheme of the audiophile universe of what you get for your money. I think there's a lot going on here. Definitely. So, oh, before you turn on your LS28 when you buy it, you have to open the lid, take off the top, and insert the four tubes into their sockets. Uh, pretty easy to do. Takes just a few minutes. But while you're in there, you get to uh, just admire the inside of this incredible preamp. Uh, but Speaking of the tubes, there's a couple of interesting features here. First is um, there's a tube counter, so you can easily keep track of how many hours you've amassed on the tubes. Now, Audio Research claims a 4,000 hour useful lifespan for these tubes. There's also an auto turn off feature, so you can set a timer basically, and after the preamp has been on for two hours or four hours or six hours or eight hours, it turns itself off. So you won't have to worry about, oh, did I forget to turn it off? It's done. Or you can set it so that it never turns itself off automatically. Another feature that I found very, very useful was phase invert, meaning you're inverting the phase of the music. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. But hit the button and it will invert the phase and then hit it again and it'll go back to where you started. And on, especially on really good recordings, you will find that it sounds the music sounds better in one position or the other. There's, it's not always the same. It depends on the recording. But it's easy to do on the remote. Which brings me to the remote. Now the remote, I have to say, I just have to say this, is eh, kind of cheesy. It's plastic. It does not feel like it belongs in the box with a $10,000 preamp. Now Audio Research has pointed out to me when I, when I griped about this to them, that it's hopefully a temporary fix because they were supplying nice metal remotes for years and years and years, but the supplier, you know, bailed or something. So now they're looking around for another metal remote. So for this plastic one is sort of a stopgap until something better comes along. And it does work. <laughs> so it just doesn't feel, it doesn't have that feel. It doesn't say, this is a $10,000 preamp. But you could do what I did and just get up off the chair and control the volume by walking over to the preamp uh, and changing the input with, on the preamp itself. And the controls feel so good. So maybe this is a sort of a plot <laughs> to get you not to use the remote, to get up off your chair and, and diddle those controls by hand. Now, I'm just joking, obviously. 
I hope a better remote is coming soon, but this one will certainly do for now. You know, I just do one other little side trip here is I recently did uh, a video about the knob, you know, how far up do you have to turn your, your preamp or integrated amp before you're saying, oh, that's, that's plenty loud, you know, so, oh, I only have to turn up to nine o'clock and it's loud or I have to turn up to 10 or whatever, you know, some audio files have a thing about that, which I really don't understand. But living with the LS28 for this week or so, I started to think about that again because this preamp has uh, a lot of gain. And th with the speakers I was using, very high sensitivity speakers, Klipsch Cornwall 4s, uh, a lot of the time I was only turning it up to 20 or 25. Now mind you, the top position of this volume control is 103, 103. Now why it's not 100 or 99, I don't know. But it goes up, it goes from zero to 103. And when I was listening quietly, I was literally listening at two or three on the volume control. And I, I just wanted, uh, it's not so much even a matter of gain, it's the taper of the volume control. I wish there was more leeway there on the lower end, so I wasn't going literally between one, two, three, four, five settings when there was all this up to 103 part going on, you know. Anyway, it's a small uh, criticism, but I would say if you're living with high sensitivity speakers, you're going to be down there at the bottom range, which certainly is bragging rights. If you if you turn around my argument here and say, oh, look, man, it goes to 103 and now it's screaming loud and it's 28. Hmm, whatever. Anyway, let's just <laughs> let's get back to the review proper. So like I've said, it, you know, order research preamps uh, to me can sound too neutral, too clean, almost like solid state. And if I want solid state, I would just listen to solid state. But the LS28 SE just a bit over to the tube side and it's incredibly transparent but there's a glow there is a glow to the sound there's a dimensionality a richness a boldness but just not overdone okay i'll put it this way it made recordings sound better <laughs> than they really are in that sense that's what i associate with the tube sound they just it just had this ability to pull out more music from the groove or from the zeros and ones and and set it free that's what was going on here that was so exciting and you know I, it was one of those products i was staying up uh, long after my bedtime because i wanted to play just one more just, oh, i want to play this one more record oh i got i have to play that one uh, yeah roll wild doing chopin i got i gotta play that one. Oh, pianos yes piano sound had just had more more of the piano, more of the percussive quality of the piano, more of the scale of the piano. This is over the Klipsch corn walls. With the, the power amp was usually the uh, first watch J2, but sometimes it was a Pass Labs XA25. I have a new policy. Starting with these, this review and maybe one before this, um, I'm going to list all of the products that I use in the review. So I'm not going to necessarily mention them as I'm talking about it. Uh, and they're all going to be in the description box. So anyway, back to the review and back to the LS28 and, and the kind of changes it put me through. But having said that, I will tell you that my reference preamp for years now is the Pass Labs XP30 solid state preamp. So I spent a good deal of time comparing the XP30 with the LS28 SE. Listening to the XP30, I just feel I'm hearing into the recordings and that's why it's been here for years and years is it, it kind of disappears. It is neutral, but, but still musical. But when I switched in the LS28 SE, I heard more, more of what, let's say the, the, the singer's intentions. I could just feel their presence more. I could sense their, their breath, their timing their body and soul, the flesh and blood, all of that just was more. There was just more of that. And then returning to the XP30, it was withdrawn. There was less, there was less musicality. Oh God, I haven't used that word in a while. There was less of that sense of human beings making music. Now I think the XP30 is freaking amazing. My, uh, my review regimen is simply this, is that I insert the product, I'm about to review into my system and I don't compare it to anything. I just put it in there. I don't even think about how it sounds different. I just live with it. 
and I get used to the new thing, in this case the LS28 SE, and then after, in this case, three or four days, I return to the reference, which is the XP30. And I kind of knew that was going to happen before I did the switch, but when I did the switch, yes, the XP30 was just a cooler character. And I don't mean even tonally. I just mean in terms of the way it went about pulling humans, <laughs> pulling that sound of humans making music out of the recording. I have to mention this blues man that I just found the other day on Cobuzz. His name is his name, I guess his band is Son of Dave. And he's basically a one-man band. And he is ferocious. His recordings are, you know, lo-fi-ish. They're not the best sounding recordings. But he, his energy, his life force just comes <laughs> barreling through like it's whoa. And I, I'll show you some of the albums that I listened to because I listened to a bunch since they were on Cobas, and I've bought some since, but I haven't received them. But Son of Dave is is a cut above most contemporary blues singers. Most contemporary blues singers, to me, sound just too much of a cliche. They're just doing the blues thing and just trying to recreate the past, which is good. It's a skill. It's a beautiful thing. But Son of Dave is just taking more, let's say, blues essence and just expressing it his own way. That's what makes it great. It's his own thing, and it sounds more contemporary than other people that I'm aware of, at least, right? <clears throat> Son of Dave is the real deal. So I'm cranking up Son of Dave and just letting it wash over me, and I was having a blast, <laughs> which is kind of the thing. That's what we're shooting for here, right? is just immersion, deep immersion into the music. Oh, I just want to mention a, a recording, this one here. Uh, I have a story about this record that I'm, I'm not going to tell now. But anyway, this record means a lot to me because Match Roach, it was his band, gave me this record. And it's an all percussion record. And all percussion records can be kind of dopey and tiring. Yeah, yeah, lots of... This isn't that. This is one of the most musical, all percussion recordings I own. It's, it was done in the early 80s, I think, or 90s, and it's digital, but really good sounding digital. And I do have the CD. I think the LP sounds better. And just to hear a room full of jazz musicians playing percussion and interacting with each other and keeping it being musical, wow. And the power, especially those bass drums, those big drums came blasting through the corn walls. And it was like something you feel. It's, it's a feel experience more than a head trip kind of sound. And uh, if you've never heard of Max Roach, he's one of the great jazz drummers of all time, right from the early days of bebop. But as a person, super sweet guy. I was with him two different times under different circumstances. And um, wow, just a great human being. But as a drummer, Wow. The Audio Research book. What an amazing, uh, it's heavy, by the way. Uh, it was written by Ken Kessler, great writer, one of the best. And there's photographs of, of the gear, of course. Lots of amazing, amazing pictures in here. And of course, there's great pictures of the people behind the product, so to speak. You know, it's a wonderful thing to put 50 years of a company's history into a book like this, uh, you know, for the fans. And if you want to learn more about the history of high-end audio in the United States, it's in this book. It's, it's a very complete tome. If you're interested in getting the book, uh, it's available through Audio Research, and I will link to the page for more information about that. Anyway, my name is Steve Guttenberg, and this is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. And today it was all about the Audio Research LS28 SE. I did, this is one of those, yes, I had a little tear in my eyes. I packed it up to ship it back to Audio Research, and I'm going to miss that preamp. But there's always the next thing coming through here. And if you like what I do, please subscribe. Hit that button, wherever it is. And uh, please subscribe. And also, but wait, there's more. Check out my Patreon, which can be found at p a 
T R E O N dot com slash audiophiliac. And I will definitely link to that directly below. And I will point out that Patreon now accepts payment in dollars, pounds, and euros. So if that's helpful to you, please check, check that out. But while you're here, you could check out the playlist. There's playlists for more electronics reviews like this, uh, speaker reviews, headphone reviews, and music reviews. And of course, interviews with all sorts of people, everyday audiophiles, and legends in the audio industry. So now I think I can say uh, my work here is at last complete. So thank you again for watching, and I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.